virology and I'm currently the head of uh, the Department of Infectious Disease in the, in the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial. And it's my pleasure today to be facilitating this forum, uh, which is all about the REACT studies. Just before I introduce REACT, uh, can I ask everyone who's not going to be a speaker to switch off their microphone and their video? And then I'll explain how everything's going to work. Um, this is the first Global Health Forum of the academic year, 2021. Uh, the forum is a platform to bring together imperial researchers, students and staff from across all the faculties to highlight and discuss and disseminate findings on current research and innovations in the global health area. Uh, it takes place on a monthly basis. Uh, this is the first one of the academic uh, year. It's been running for a number of years. Um, apparently, we're going to be live tweeting throughout the event. When I say we, uh, probably some people will be live tweeting throughout the event. Um, you can get involved in any conversations on Twitter using a hashtag, IGHI Forum. Um, and the, our Twitter handle is at Imperial underscore IGHI. OK, so the topic for today is the REACT programme. REACT stands for Real Time Assessment of Community Transmission. And this is a programme that began in April 2020 to track the progress of infection with SARS-CoV-2 the causative agent of COVID across England. It's been commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Care and carried out in partnership with Ipsos Mori uh, and of course Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. There are two main arms of the programme you're going to hear about today. REACT 1, which analyses throat and nose swabs and samples to understand prevalence of COVID and break down across different demographies, regions. And then REACT2, which has been assessing antibody responses using fingerprint tests, um, looking at whether these tests are accurate, uh, can be used at home, and then using them to look at uh, zero surveillance studies. So this afternoon, we're going to have three talks. Um, and you've got the chance to ask speakers questions. You can either put questions into the chat as we go along, and then we'll pick them up in discussion later, or you can, you can ask your questions at the end. So we're going to begin this afternoon uh, with the first talk, which is from Professor Paul Elliott. Uh, and he's going to tell us about REACT1, which is the Community Prevalence Study, PCR Positivity in England. So, Paul, over to you. Thank, thanks very much, Wendy. So, Nikita, if you can put the slides up, please. Yes, so Wendy's already said that the REACT study stands for real time assessment of community transmission. And indeed, I'm going to be talking about uh, REACT 1, which is all about tracking the virus in the community over time. Next slide, please. Uh, so very briefly, this is uh, this slide summarizes uh, the design. It's a monthly survey um, and we invite uh, actually taking part between 120,000 and 170,000 people have taken part each month. And importantly, these people are randomly selected uh, using the NHS register of patients in England um, to be more or less equally distributed across all the 315 lower tier local authorities so that we can get an estimate of the distribution of the virus uh, geographically, um, as well as um, by demographics and other characteristics. And as Wendy says, it relies on a nose and throat swab. Um, so people are invited to take part. They get a letter. Uh, if they want to take part, they then register on our website, which is uh, has been set up and maintained by our partners, Ipsos Mori, or they can ring a help desk. Um, they then request uh, that a swab is sent to them at their home. They, uh, there are instructions to, to carry out the swab, including a, a video that they can follow. They then put the swab in the fridge and they arrange for a courier to pick up the swab. And then it then goes on a cold chain um, between four and eight degrees all the way to the lab where the lab analysis is carried out and the results reported. If there's a positive test in recent rounds, that person will be contacted and put into test and trace. And this allows us to uh, evaluate the prevalence of the virus 
um, at each round of the survey and also look at the change in prevalence over time. And that allows us to get an estimate of the reproduction number or the R value. And as I'm sure everyone here knows that an R value above one means that the epidemic is increasing and an R value below one means the epidemic is decreasing. And we're then able to work out the prevalence, uh, you know, nationally, regionally, and also by age, sex, and by other characteristics such as key worker status, ethnicity, household size, and so forth. We currently completed five rounds of the survey, pretty much monthly. So the first round was during May of this year when we were still in lockdown and as we came to the end of lockdown. So that was uh, monitoring the, the virus um, after the uh, peak of the epidemic in March and April of this year. We then followed the epidemic through um, three more rounds, June to July, July to August, <coughs> and, um, and then August to September, where we started to see an uptick in the virus. Uh, more or less mid-August towards the beginning of September. And we've just reported uh, last week the results of round five, which was undertaken 18th of September to the 5th of October. And then the next round is scheduled to start this Saturday. The first swabs will be picked up uh, this Saturday on the 17th of October. Next slide, please. And what's really nice about the design of the survey is that we are measuring uh, the virus, if you like, in real time. And we can, without modelling, we can really see what's been happening with the virus. And that's sort of summarised in this slide, but also when we get to the next slide, pictorially. So in round one, which was, as I say, through May, uh, out of 120,000 swabs, we found 159 that were positive. We then went up to 160,000 swabs and 123 positive. And then um, from July to mid-August, it went right down to, to 54. And you can see that there's just been a rapid decline in the amount of virus. But as I said, as we came through August into September, there was then a rapid increase. And then a very rapid increase when we get to the 175,000 swabs that we did in round five, that is uh, mid-September through to the 5th of October, you can see there was a massive uptick, a massive rise in the uh, numbers of positive cases and therefore in the prevalence of the virus. Next slide. And that's summarised in this slide. You can see uh, this gives the uh, prevalence by round, and you can see that um, moving from round four to round five, there was a massive increase. And actually, we reported round five. We had so many cases, we were able to report round five after the first half, the first eight days of the of the sampling, which is the light blue bar. And then even between then and the second half, you can see there was a further rise, which is the dark blue bar on the right hand side. Next slide, please. And we can look by uh, demographics. So this is looking by age in the most recent round. And you can see that, um, so in the most recent round is the, the dark blue, but this is across all rounds. But you can see in the most recent round, that um, the, the the highest prevalence is occurring in the 18 to 24 year old group. And that was pretty much the case across all the rounds, but clearly the prevalence is much, much higher. Um, it's actually over 1% for the uh, 18 to 24 year olds. The other thing to notice is that if you look at the, um, the last bar in each age group compared to the previous one, there's been a big uprise at every single age. So the idea that this was somehow being contained within the younger age group just isn't the case. It's happening right across all age groups, such that in the on the right hand side, which is the 65 year old plus, um, the uh, prevalence went up eightfold between the, the uh, fourth round and the most recent round. Next slide, please. And this is looking by region and there's been a lot of attention on what's happening in, in the northwest and you can see that the uh, prevalence in the northwest, which is the third one along, um, is very high. It's one percent, 
um, and a big increase from round four, but also an increase right across the country between rounds four and round five, but very high prevalence now in the northwest, the northeast and Yorkshire and the Humber. Uh, and, and that's where clearly there's been a lot of attention recently, including the tier three lockdown for Liverpool that's just been announced. Next slide, please. And if we look at the detail, because we have so many cases in, in our most recent survey, we were able to look actually at the numbers and the prevalence by uh, lower tier local authority area. That's summarised in this slide. And you can see the um, that in the northwest in particular, the northeast uh, and Yorkshire, there there is um, higher prevalence in, in, in those local authority areas, but other areas scattered around the country where there is also some evidence of higher prevalence, but mainly in the north, west, northeast and Yorkshire. Next slide, please. This slide summarises what's been happening with those trends that really I, you know, you, to be honest, you really only need to look at the numbers in the very first slide I showed you. This does involve a little bit of modelling. Um, it's, 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 it's fitting a very simple exponential model at the top between uh, subsequent rounds. So the yellow is between round one and round two, and you can see the decline. And then the purple declining again to between two and three. And then, as I say, uh, we started to see an increase in August uh, to September, and then that very steep increase, uh, the pink. But at the bottom, we actually fit uh, a, a similar exponential model to each round. And you can see declines happening in, in round one and round two with a bit of a blip between them. We think there may have been a little bit of increase between the round one and, and round two. And then in August, you can see that the, 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 the um, uh, amount of virus started taking off, taking off very steeply in September. And then in our, our latest round, actually it's slightly flattened off, but very robustly the R value is above one. Next slide, please. And this gives the, the R value uh, that we reported. So um, the key uh, thing to look at is the, is the first row looking at all positives. Um, and uh, we do an estimate between rounds, between four and five, the reproduction number there uh, you can see is 1.39, which equates to a doubling time of um, 13 days. And then within round five alone, it's 1.16, robustly above one with a probability of close to one that the that that value is greater than one but it's a little bit less steep so uh, with a doubling time of 29 days so we do have some evidence that in the most recent period where the where the prevalence is very high the rate of increase has slowed a little bit probably in relation to the public health measures and the various uh, things that have been implemented, such as rule of six, but not enough to turn the virus down. It's continuing to rise. And then the other numbers on that chart are looking at other subgroups uh, where we basically see very similar findings. Next slide, please. And I should say that 50% of our survey, uh, people who test positive do not report symptoms on, on the day of the swab or in the previous week. So we have 50% 50, 50 non-symptomatic people. Th these people would not present to the routine test and tracing uh, through what's called pillar two. Um, but, um, and, and in previous rounds, it was slightly higher. So at least 50% of people who, who are testing positive for the virus in the population, in the general population, are not presenting with symptoms. We also had enough data to look at regional trends and you can see uh, on the top right, that's the northwest and the very right hand side on the top right is uh, the trend in northwest. So not only is it very high, but the trend in the northwest is uh, continuing to increase and robustly that R value is above one. Whereas in London, which is on the left top, it's actually flattened off. So in our data, with quite wide confidence limits, uh, London seems to uh, have a maybe even a flat trajectory or a, certainly a less steep trajectory, 
and I think that's um, reflected in the in the pressure on NHS beds uh, and ITU that we see in London so far. Although, of course, we're keeping a watching brief, uh, but in most other regions, uh, it's increasing. Next slide, please. And we do have our values uh, in round five uh, for those regions, and you can see northwest it's 1.27. Um, with a high probability that that's greater than one. Um, and a Yorkshire and hum Humber 1.37, again, high probability greater than one. And then in West Midlands, similarly, whereas in London, it's around one, but with quite wide confidence limits. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Uh, so what did we conclude? So first of all, um, there's been a rapid rise in the prevalence of the virus uh, that we first detected uh, upturning within the react one data actually all the way back in mid-august through to beginning of september a very rapid rise at the beginning of september with an r value of around 1.7 which equates to a doubling time of seven to eight days and that's what got reported at that time not surprisingly as a result of that very high uh, rate of rise of the virus we've ended up with high prevalence rates, particularly in the north of the country. And overall, the prevalence is now one in 170 people between September and October uh, um, during round five. It's not just affecting the younger people, although the younger people do have the highest prevalence. It's affecting all ages, including the older people who are more at risk. Uh, we have robust evidence, even within round five, our most latest data, that the epidemic is growing nationally uh, with an R value above one. Although there is substantial regional variation with um, higher rates of growth in the Northwest, Yorkshire and the West Midlands. And what's really important is that this study is providing vital information on prevalence of the virus in the community that is independent of the symptomatic testing through the health service. So it's not been caught up in the in the inability to get tests or in um, uh, certain groups, you know, trying to, you know, getting tests because they're symptomatic in more in some areas than others. It's independent of that whole process. Clearly, the virus is dangerously high and continues to rise. So we have to redouble our efforts on the public health message, and we know it's about social mixing social distancing and then hand washing and face covering. We do need to identify those people who have the virus and that means symptomatic people getting a test, getting a rapid result, isolating and then quarantining of their household members. And we have to pay attention uh, that the virus does not escape again uh, from hospitals into care homes because those communities are vulnerable. And just to say that in REACT 1, over 750,000 people have so far taken part in the study. So it's been a fantastic effort uh, on behalf of the public to provide what we believe are really important data to inform uh, where the virus is uh, and therefore to inform the, the, the response, the government response, the public health response. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, fantastic overview and a real achievement. Um, We'll take questions at the end, as I've mentioned before, but if they occur to you as the speakers are going through their talks, please do post them into the chat to, to get your question registered. Um, we're next going to turn to Professor Graham Cook. Um, he's going to talk about the second arm of the REACT project, which is called REACT 2, all about zero prevalence, measuring antibodies through home testing. So, Graham, over to you. Thanks. Um, Nikita, I think it would be helpful. Could you upload the slides? Um, I'm taking our lead from our chief medical officer in my mastery of PowerPoint at this point. Great. 
Thank you very much. So, um, and thank you, Wendy, for the introduction and, and for Paul for explaining React 1. So um, I'm going to focus on the other part of React. So if we go to the, the next slide, Nikita, um, can I control them? Oh, I can. Um, so as we've heard then within React, we have these, these two parallel programs. Um, React 1, you've heard about in detail from Paul. React 2 is um, also focused on self-testing at home, but looking at antibody seroprevalence uh, to try and get an estimate of prevalence in the community. So if we go to the next slide, then if we want to understand, the, you know, one of the real questions is what proportion of the population has been infected previously? And this is, was particularly important to understand after the first wave in March and April. So to do that, we really need a very large representative sample of the population. And we need to be able to sample them within a very narrow and defined time window so that we can be confident that we're, we're getting a, a representation of a moment in time. And we need a reliable measure to be able to detect previous infection. So on the next slide, I'll show you, broadly speaking, we've got two approaches to this. Here we are, slowly fading into view. So. Um, Generally speaking, if you're in hospital and you're having a blood test taken for antibodies, it'll be based on one of these platforms on the left, which would be a relatively high throughput, well standardized platform where an antibody tests have what we would call high specificity. In other words, uh, the number of false, neg uh, false positives that the platform develops is very low and they can process a large number of samples. But it does require a blood sample to be carried from the patient to the lab, which is obviously more easy in hospital much harder to do in the community and um, the tests themselves are relatively expensive. So doing this at scale for a country quickly is difficult and it's not really um, a solution to what we want to do for a seroprevalence study. Point of care tests like the one you see in the picture here, these kind of lateral flow tests we call them, um, are increasingly available. Um, there's been some concerns about their quality uh, and they can have lower specificity so they can generate more false positives, which is a, a key issue if you're trying to do big numbers of tests. But they do have the potential for self-testing um, with the finger prick blood sample and they're much, much cheaper. And obviously, um, in theory, people can read them themselves and generate the result uh, rather than having to have someone else do that for them. So they're a much more attractive tool uh, for doing this. Um, but on the next slide, I'll show you, um, and you may recall back in March and April of this year, um, when things were really at their height in terms of the first peak, um, there was a lot of publicity around these tests about how the government had bought, bought a large number and a number of stories in the press uh, about how they weren't any good. Uh, and so when we picked up this project in March and April, it was really quite a toxic area that, that we had to be very careful about. So I'll show you briefly what we did to try and get to the point where we were comfortable to, to mail these out at scale. So on the next slide, I'll show you in contrast to React 1, um, where we're using a, a well-established methodology with um, uh, nasal swabbing and PCR, we felt we needed to do more work for REACT2 with these lateral flow tests, partly to understand their performance in the clinic um, and partly under to understand how well people could use them at home before going on. And so we broke this down into five sub-studies. Sub I'm just going to focus very briefly on one and then five, and then um, Philippa will pick up a little bit more about studies two and three in a minute. So if we go to study one, We could have the next slide, Nikita. One of the key issues is when you're using a, a test like this, then you want to validate it in the population where you're going to use it in your study. And obviously, for that, for that, that means for us people at home, most of whom won't have been hospitalised. And one of the big issues with the early validation studies was that they were done in relatively small numbers of patients and tended to focus on people hospitalized with illness who obviously might have higher antibody levels and that might not give you a representative uh, idea of how well these tests work. So the first piece of work we did was in a close collaboration with Imperial College Healthcare Trust and Chelsea and Westminster Trust uh, where we asked healthcare workers who definitely had infection with PCR proven infection to come at least three weeks after their illness uh, and try these tests uh, for themselves in the clinic. And so we knew that they should be positive in, in those patients. And at the same time, we took blood from them and, and analyzed that in the lab. And, and the lab team ran the same tests in the lab so we could see how well the same tests performed and, and compare the performance between the clinic 
and the lab. And in addition, we wanted to know about specificity. So the only way of really doing that is to look at samples that are old, that predate the arrival of the virus. So we had a sample from one of Paul Elliott's studies, airwaves um, from police officers in 2019, and we were able to run large numbers of tests in that cohort to understand how many false positives these might generate and give us an estimate of specificity. If we have the next slide. So what we did was create really quite a robust pipeline for evaluating these tests. And overall, uh, when we published the first output at the end of July, uh, we'd evaluated over six and a half thousand individual tests in both the lab and the clinic. Uh, and also used some new methods developed within the lab here by uh, Richard Tedder and Myron McClure and their teams uh, as gold standards, trying to compare the performance of these uh, point of care tests with those gold standards in the lab. We can have the next slide. So in our first report, we uh, reported data on 11 of these slides. Um, and what we found was that most of them had good specificity. So the MHRA have criteria which they require tests to meet, and most of them met those criteria. However, the sensitivity, in other words, how good they were at picking up people we definitely knew had infection, uh, wasn't quite as good. And in many cases, it was below the 98% threshold set by MHRA. Uh, but nonetheless, we were able to identify four tests that were achieving sensitivity in the region of 80 to 90 percent, which for our purposes, not for individual patient management, but for population seroprevalence, uh, was in the range that we've considered acceptable for the work. And on the next slide, I'll just show you the sort of summary data uh, of what, what we found with those tests. Um, and to highlight perhaps the top one, a particular test where it, with the green triangles, you can see high levels of sensitivity um, in the lab, but in the clinic, very much lower sensitivity. And this for us highlights the importance of actually evaluating these with patients. You'll see a lot of these evaluations done in the lab, which can be misleading. And so we eventually settled on the Fortress test, uh, which we've then used subsequently in the different rounds of, of REACT uh, in study five. And I'll come on to the results from that shortly. On the next slide, please. Um, again, just to show you what these tests look like. So on the left, uh, we have a, a negative test. The, the blood has gone into that square well, and the single line shows a, a negative control uh, with no other lines visible. So this would be a negative test. And on the right, you can see probably a little bit fainter. You can still see the control red line, um, but below it, you can see a second line showing the presence of IgG antibodies. Uh, and the more astute of you will notice that um, there's a shadow of a camera. So what we're asking people to do in these studies is to take a, a, an iPhone or camera phone picture of these uh, tests and upload those so we can have some sort of validation uh, for how they've been read. And what you don't need to be so astute to notice is how much blood is over it. And I think that sort of emphasizes that this is not a trivial thing to ask people to do. And so before we emailed these out to people uh, at scale, we felt there was a lot of work needed to do uh, with patients and with, with patient participation to do that. Um, on the next slide, we just outlined some of those pieces of work that were done. So um, uh, Philippa will talk about this in more detail, but just, just to emphasize again that uh, we did two studies, study two and study three, with both a, a panel of volunteers and over 1,400 members of the public. One of the largest usability studies that's been done to try and help inform how we do this. Uh, on the next slide, I can show you a little bit more about what we ended up with. And essentially, we tailored the packaging and, and what was in it based on this, and you'll hear a bit more about that later. But this is what people were received. I would be surprised if someone listening hasn't received this themselves, and I'm sure someone you know has. As Paul says, that um, there's been over uh, 1.2 million people now tested within the REACT program of one form or another. So on the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the seroprevalence study and um, how far we've got with that. So there are three rounds now completed to date. Um, I'll present to you a little bit of the data from the first round, which was over 100,000 people who completed the test, and we now have two subsequent rounds completed. So, uh, over uh, 3,500, 3, sorry, 350,000 people who've had these tests done at this point. Um, on the next slide, what we what we were able to do with the first wave of this work um, at the end of June and July was to recreate the epidemic 
we've got. So people who are filling, uh, people who are doing these tests, go online if you haven't done one. Uh, you have a questionnaire which is managed by our partners, Ipsos Mori, and people fill in a relatively detailed questionnaire on their um, on their symptoms and their other um, engagement with healthcare around uh, COVID. And this allows us to look at the positive results and, and ascertain the timing of onset of, of infection. And as you can see on the left, we were able to recreate in the dotted line uh, the peak of infections around April of this year, um, which um, preceded the peak in deaths in the black line from, from ONS data. And on the right, I won't go through a lot of the detail, but you can see that the proportion of uh, cases that were positive during this time period evolved particularly in relation to ethnicity of those being infected. And you can see that early on, a uh, relatively small proportion of people from minority ethnic groups, but that rose during the epidemic and, and was probably a, a function in part of key workers and other, um, uh, other groups who continued to work through the first wave. On the next slide, we were able to map at a reasonably high level of detail the prevalence of, of antibodies and as you can see uh, in London in particular the prevalence of antibodies overall was relatively high compared to the country as a whole it was about six percent across the country and the region of 13 percent in London and you can also see relevant to the discussions in react one and, and what you'll see on the news at the moment that there was a relatively high seroprevalence in parts of the northwest and, and uh, the midlands in particular um, on to the next slide please So there are lots of lots of bits of data in here, and I think I'd, I'd recommend that you look at the preprint if you're interested. But as I've mentioned, um, the prevalence was clearly highest in London and lowest in the southwest. There was a slight difference between males and females, but no, nowhere near as much as there is in the difference between morbidity and mortality uh, between males and females. Uh, as with the uh, PCR testing, the prevalence was highest in the younger age groups. Uh, and it was highest in key workers, uh, and in particularly those who worked in care homes. Uh, it wasn't associated with BMI or the presence of comorbidities, and I think this is quite helpful to understand um, why uh, some of the some of the associations with death that we that we see with with, with those particular factors. And in relation to ethnicity, there was a very clear finding that uh, black, Asian, and mixed ethnicity groups had very much clear, clearly higher prevalence um, compared to those of white ethnicity. And I'll show you a bit more if we can go to the next slide on that. So broadly speaking, 6% um, of the population had evidence of antibodies. Uh, that was 5% in the white population. And you can see here, uh, taking into account a number of different factors, if you look at the second block down in ethnicity, that the prevalence in black populations was nearly threefold uh, that in white populations. Uh, and I won't go through all of this, but um, just to highlight as well that one of the factors associated with risk of infection appeared to be household size, where we saw an increasing risk with increasing household size. And as Paul said, um, in the PCR survey, a significant proportion of patients there don't report symptoms. We estimate just over about 30% of patients didn't have evidence of uh, symptomatic illness, despite having antibody, um, antibodies detectable uh, in their serum or, or blood. And the next slide. And this is just to show you what you can do once you once you get a better understanding of the um, the numbers of people infected, you can understand a little bit more about whether there's a difference in mortality rates between these groups. And so this was trying to look at this in more detail, comparing by breaking down by gender and age groups and, and looking at the effect of ethnicity. So although we know that there's been a, a disproportionately high number of deaths in, in black and ethnic minority groups, when we look at the breakdown of the um, infection fatality ratio based on an understanding of the infection, it doesn't dif differ very much between ethnic groups. Um, so whether or not you look at um, under 65 or over 65 in women and the same in men, broadly speaking, the IFRs are quite consistent. And this is quite helpful to understand. It does suggest that that difference we're seeing in death probably relates to a difference in infection and the risks for infection rather than progression or, or the care that's delivered following infection. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, 
I'll just finish with a couple of conclusions. I mean, I think one of the things that this um, survey and the first wave in particular has been able to show with a lot more precision and power than has been possible from other studies is the unequal social impact of the first wave of infection, particularly in relation to ethnic group. And I think this has been helpful not only to understand the, the magnitude of that effect in the population, but also the need for greater protection of high risk groups. And more broadly, I think both REACT1 and REACT2 together have provided a huge amount of data and understanding about how to do tests in general at home. This is something that's generally not been done a lot in other infections and other diseases. And this is a huge uh, amount of data and experience, which is probably going to be helpful for a number of other studies and possibly other diseases uh, going forward. So on the last slide, if we can go to that. Uh, okay, penultimate slide. So wh where are we going next with this? We'll probably cover some of this in questions, but obviously we're completing the analysis of waves two and three uh, and starting to think about some of the evidence we have for a declining seroprevalence in later uh, waves, which we can come back to. Um, but obviously this is a huge resource and we're starting to collaborate with a number of groups, uh, for example, Genomics England to understand risks of infection. Uh, we're working with uh, the SAGE subgroup on ethnicity to help inform policy around housing in particular, uh, and working with the um, digital groups in, in Imperial to look at, look at these images in a more automated way that we might, might be able to scale up. So I'll finish there. On the last slide, you'll see when it comes up that um, this has really been a, a tremendous collaborative effort internally across a number of groups within Imperial, many of whom we know each other but haven't worked very closely together before. Uh, and I'm sure I've missed people off, but you can just get a sense of, of what a sort of effort this has been across a number of groups. So I thank you for that. Great. Thanks very much, Graham. That was a, a tour de force through React 2. Uh, and as you mentioned, a really important component of it was understanding how people would respond uh, to using these tests. And in the final talk of this three, we're going to turn to Dr. Philippa Pristera, who's um, going to talk about the work that was done as part of REACT uh, through the Patient Experience Research Centre um, about how the public really shaped uh, the REACT study. So over to you, Philippa. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Nikita, I think I'll attempt to share my slides. I'll break the norm, but if it, if it all fails, then... Um, I'll ask you to load it if that's okay. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see my slides now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, brilliant. Um, so yeah, thank you um, to Paul and Graham for um, providing you guys with the um, a great overview and explanation of the, the two studies themselves, React 1 and React 2. <clears throat> For my um, talk, I've been tasked to kind of provide an insight into the kind of public involvement and engagement side of, of React. Um, I am going to focus probably my, primarily on React 2, as Graham said, for the antibody testing, um, but the principles of involving the public in shaping um, the studies did also apply to React 1, and I'll, I'll mention it briefly towards the end. So I'm going to start first actually by providing some, some definitions, because I might um, to use public engagement and involvement interchangeably but they are different and then sort of say the, why the importance of public involvement so when we talk about public engagement that's typically where you have um, information sort of shared um, and knowledge about research to members of the public and it can be a two-way um, conversation um, but it tends to be about sharing knowledge um, about research findings this typically your sort of science festivals and seminars um, after our events when we say public involvement, this is really where we're getting members of the public or people with who are the sort of the subjects of of the research to provide their sh um, their views and experiences in order to guide and inform the how the research is designed, how it's carried out, um, shared and adopted as well. So you. Know, as part of this research, we have to provide um, invitations to take part in the research, letters explaining what the research is, and involving the public in making sure that those letters um, are accessible and the language is clear is really important for both studies. Um, but particularly the reason why I'm going to talk about REACT um, 2 and the antibody testing is because um, these were, as Graham said, there was a lot in the media about these antibody tests um, not being um, accurate enough um, so being useless, not being helpful for research, um, but also they were not 
ever used before with the public. And so we had an obligation not to just send out hundreds of thousands of antibody tests, which require people to prick their finger and drip blood or put blood into a test. We had to make sure that we understood how the public would use them. Um, we had to understand that they were safe. Um, we also um, had lots of questions about the usability. Are people able to use them correctly? Um, and are they able to um, provide uh, read the, the results themselves? Um, unlike React 1, where the, the uh, lab, um, the tests are sent back to the labs. Here we are relying on the public to perform the test, read the test themselves and report to us. So all the data comes from the public. And just to show you again for the fingerprint antibody testing, the steps um, that it required in case you have not taken part yourself. Um, they, they are sent the um, instruction booklets in a little um, packet along with all the test um, testing kit. And the yellow device that you see on the screen is the Lancet. And again, was a, a word that came up um, as sort of not necessarily being something that the, the public would understand. Um, and people would have to um, prick their finger with the with a um, finger prick device, the Lancet, and then either use a pipette or, or drip the um, blood into the test um, window apply some um, some solution test, test solution and then wait 15 or 10 to 15 minutes for the test result and then read that result and then take an online survey to provide their test result to us along with some other questions <coughs> so to be able to um oh my sorry it's not working <coughs> so as graham said the um study that we um, put forward had a lot of um, sub-studies. Now, essentially, we've embedded the public involvement element into the design of React 2, and study 2 and study 3 were really the um, acceptability and usability testing, where we wanted to understand what the public um, thought about these tests, how they used them, um, and allow some sort of iterative changes to the material before we went to large scale testing. So this was the sort of research design as we had it in our heads. But then what did that look like in reality? So before even starting all of that, we actually first um, started with a Zoom call. Um, I think we were due to um, start the, the study um, second week of May. So one week before we organized very quickly a, um, a conference call via Zoom. We brought together members of the public who were invited. We just sent out via our public channels and via Twitter, inviting members of the public to join a Zoom call to have a discussion about antibody testing. Um, we'd had a number of online discussions already with members of the public um, talking about things that are very important about COVID, modeling, um, the test and trace app. So we'd already sort of been running a series of these events already. And so we hosted one about antibody testing. And during the call, we gave an overview of the React studies and then really we wanted to understand from them whether they thought it was acceptable to send these tests out um, to you know, deliver them through people's doors and ask them to take part, what they thought would be the perceived usability challenges, um, any accessibility about the language um, and, and really the key thing was the questions that they had. And it was really useful for that, actually. The, the questions that people um, shared during this call were actually passed to Ipsos Mori, and that was used to develop the team's um, FAQ document that they then used when participant, participants of the study phoned the helpline. So they were already primed with the kind of questions that people were going to have about this study. The perceived usability challenges that they, they shared were then things that we could um, see if we could try and overcome with the instruction booklet or things that we could look out for in the data to see if the things that people um, wondered whether they would be an issue would actually be um, an issue in reality. Um, there was um, definite overall support for at-home antibody testing. Um, I think it was during lockdown, people um, were very, very keen to access testing but for us, it was very important um, at that time, as Graham said, that when we were running these events and starting the React program at that early stage, we did not know really how accurate these antibody tests were. And it was very important for people who were taking part in the study that they were taking part for research purposes and to, to explain to them that the, the results of the test may not be accurate and therefore that they shouldn't um, change their behaviour. 
um, as a result of the test. You know, we didn't know how accurate they were, so whether people's results were going to be um, correct. But it, even with that, we still actually do not know whether and having antibodies provides protection. So even if someone got a positive result, an accurate one, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're protected from not getting COVID-19 again. And therefore, it was very important within the messaging that we were clear for people to carry on following government guidance, regardless of the antibody testing um, test results. Um, and so it was, again, through these conversations with the public, we were able to kind of um, trial and sort of test some of the messaging and get them to sort of um, support us in how we delivered that message clearly um, to the people who were going to be taking part in the study. Um, and um, not surprisingly, um, they were very um, keen to make sure that the, the data sharing process was clear to participants, but also that the um, so they wanted assurances that the design of the study would ensure um, representation from BAME communities um, amongst the volunteers. Now, obviously, it's um, a random selection, so that is you know, aiming to hopefully overcome part of that and get a representative sample of the population. Um, but we um, have always decided you know, to make sure that we we review the um, data that comes through to to, to see whether um, people from BAME communities are also participating in the study as well. So after that call, we wrote up um, the report um, as an insight report. We presented um, to the research team the same day, that same evening. And then the, the following week, we began our real world testing. So this is React 2 Study 2. And this was in just um, 234 members of the public. We sent our um, invites out to them. And this was, again, through the public channels that we had at that stage, through the, the members of the public who joined the call. And so they shared it. Um, amongst their networks and this was really user testing this was um not sort of high designed it was really to see what are the key issues that people may face using this um, antibody test um it also included some observational studies so amongst the um, 234 members of the public who took part in trialing the test we also selected um, a proportion to um, observe via um, teams so we watched them while they performed the test and also did one to one interviews again via Teams um, to um, get more in depth um, understanding of their experience, the kind of um, issues that they faced. Um, and I say the observational studies were um, extremely useful because watching people perform it, I mean, it's always the question that you could sort of interfere, but um, there were definitely things that we couldn't have predicted with the way that people use the tests. For example, the Lancet itself, I've shown you on the, the screen, we've got um, the Lancet that the people in the first study used, which had the release lever to activate it on the side and a cap on the front. And um, it was surprising actually how many people um, looked at the Lancet and thought it worked like a pen and that the cap was the button that you press with your thumb and you press the other end on your finger. And um, and not that the cap itself was was disguising the needle. So it made us realise that within our instruction booklet, we had to make it clearer where the needle was and what the cap is is hiding. Um, and through the study, though, through that user testing, we realised that the Lancet, however much you you rewrite the instruction booklet, is just not uh, an intuitive Lancet. Um, this is a needle device, and so we changed the Lancet to one that is. Um, more intuitive to use. It was a kind of more natural um, device. The cap came off more easily. Um, and the pipette, which is that um, <clears throat> the device you see here, which is used to, to collect um, the sample. Um, and again, there were many issues with, with this. Um, and we, we changed the pipette a number of times um, because the, the idea was that actually, unlike normally you would sort of squeeze one end to, to pull up a, a solution. In this case, we actually didn't want people to squeeze the, the bulbous end at the end to, to pull the liquid up. We needed them just to place the end of the pipette against the blood and it would it was um, move naturally into the pipette without any any squeezing of the pipette. And that was a, a, a step that I think, again, people couldn't help but squeeze the end of the, the pipette and it meant that a lot of air went in into the pipette and as they came try to get the blood out it kind of had air in there and bubbles and splattered so it never came out very easily and so in the end um later on we actually decided that people could just drip the blood into the um onto the testing stick um but it really was an iterative process sort of you know, trying to sort of anticipate issues and overcome them and um members of the public helped again with each of those steps to to reshape um the instruction booklet to make it clearer so once we'd done that um, 
the, the user testing with the um, 230 members of the public, we then moved to the much larger um, React uh, to study three. This is the largest test of usability um, ever performed for antibody testing. This was with 14,400 members of the public. Um, these were actually sent um, invite letters. This was then managed by Ipsos Mori. They sent out um, invite letters um, at random, according to, at that time, it was the, the postal um, database, postal address database. Um, and then those who decided to take part registered via an online survey. And then once they'd performed the test, um, again, um, carried out an online survey um, to provide their feedback about um, Ask questions also about symptoms, um, their kind of characteristics, and the result of the, their test as well. And um, this time, the majority did get um, a valid test result <clears throat> and correctly interpreted the result. But there were continued issues with the pipette. Um, the the antibody kit itself as well was changed halfway through when the um, study one, which Graham said the lab testing found a different antibody testing kit was performing um, better in the lab. And so we decided to go for this one for the sort of second wave of the study three. Um, but both both antibody tests and um, testing kits um, performed well. They um, got high level of um, valid results, um, but there were continued issues with the pipette. Um, and it really, we started to have questions about whether people, about the, how people were responding to the test result. Something that had come up in the early user testing was most people understood the study. They understood that it, it you know, wasn't accurate. However, there were a few people who had very strong responses to the antibody test. Even if you say to people that the test is not accurate, just ignore it once you've done it. I think in reality, a lot of there's a lot of um, things going on for people. People are sort of desperate to have these antibody tests, even if they're not accurate. And for some people, getting a, a positive result when you're expecting a negative, or getting a negative result when you're getting a positive, can actually have a very strong emotional response. So we are also um, aware of our obligations as well when people are participating to make sure that they're supported. And it's something that actually we're still um, aware of and actually want to continue to um, address. Um, and as a result, actually, we've we've decided to carry out an additional sort of sub an additional sub study, um, study five B, where people are um, a, a group of people who've taken part have been followed up and interviewed about their experience and whether um, they've changed their behaviour and and what they thought of their test results. So that data is going to be coming out um, soon, and it's it's um, interesting to see. <clears throat> All right, okay. okay. And um, then, so that, um, after that, we had we had public involvement going on throughout. We always had these um, members of the public who support us during our research, who were kind of um, reviewing the study documents. But we decided to establish a formal advisory group. Um, we meet every fortnight for a sort of one to one and a half hours via Zoom. And we tend in this uh, meeting, we present the findings that we've the latest findings, latest issues that we have, and they kind of continually provide guidance and feedback on the material, the plans. And this is where it's been applied to both React 1 and React 2. They've reviewed um, a number of times the questionnaires and the surveys that have gone out for React 1 and React 2, the, the study, let, the invite letters. Um, and it's been very um, important and useful to sort of provide us with the public's perspective. Because I think when you're working in research um, continually, you can kind of you, you forget how much you know, and you, you forget what the what the sort of general public are thinking and how they're being influenced by the media. So that have been a very useful guidance for us. Um, and so with and this all happened within one month, and that really then let the sort of study five um, nationwide testing begin in in June the the, the month afterwards, um, and. Um, as both Paul and Graham said, there's been a, a very, very high uptake, um, fortunately low rate of invalid results, and it's provided um, very important insight into the shape of the UK's epidemic. Um, this is just to touch on some additional public kind of engagement involvement that we've been doing um, since then. So obviously there's a number of rounds of both um, React 1 and React 2 have been ongoing, um, but we have um, tried to con continue to engage the public in the project as well to sort of provide um, 
updates about the the purpose of the study. So we ran a, a Q and A, um, a live Q and A via um, YouTube on antibody testing, um, and that was a, a great opportunity to really um, sort of answer people's questions and to hear what they were sort of their thoughts. Um, we also did a an, an online public involvement um, survey, kind of called an involvement sprint. We wanted the views of um, parents, um, young people, um, to see what their views were on the idea of performing antibody testing on children. So react to the antibody testing so far as only on adults. And there was um, the possibility of um, extending that to include children. But again, we didn't want to um, assume what the acceptability of that would be and what age would be the limit. And so that was really interesting. We got a huge response. I mean, 4,290 people responded in three days on an online survey. Um, and again, a uh, great sort of accept, you know, um, willingness to, to do it um, and um, in any age, actually. Um, however, there were some key um, issues that they foresaw and some sort of concerns that people had and sort of some stipulations there. Well, if it happened, then it would need to happen here and by this person. Um, but it was a useful exercise so that if ever antibody testing does extend into this age group, we've we've got some great um, insight that could inform how that could actually be carried out. Um, so that's that's my bit. And and really, when you add up all the numbers, members of the public who've taken part, who've engaged and involved, it is well over one million members of the public. And so it's just a, really a huge thanks to them. Um, it's it's all really come from them. Um, and the early user testing public involvement really helped to ensure that we had sort of the high validity of results. It enabled us to continually improve the study, and we we, we continue to. We we are in touch with us, Ipsos Mori as well to hear what kind of questions are coming through on the helpline because those questions might be things that we can fix with the invite letters or with the um, communication that we send out. And it really made us aware of how our research impacts and influences the public and how important or how sensitive you know testing is for the public. Um, they still, despite you know what we have said. Um, people still want access to <laughs> antibody testing as well. Um, and there's a lot of emotion that goes into it. So we've got to be very aware of that and make sure that we're not only just doing research you know, for the, um, you know, for the uh, our UK's response and for the greater good, but also um, they need to be um, conscious of them and, and make sure that they benefit as well. And that it's not a one way um, um, partnership. Um, and then a member of the public was actually meant to join me with his presentation. Um, unfortunately, she wasn't able to. Um, she was from the, the React Public Advisory Group, and I asked her if there was anything she wanted to, to highlight. And the only thing was that she thinks that, you know, forget about this, this myth that people don't want to take part in research. Um, people are very willing to take part as long as there's um, transparency in how their data is used, stored and shared. So I thought I'd mention that. Um, Thanks very yeah, much. Thank Philippa. you. That's brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, we've got a few minutes left to, we can see that there have been some questions on the chat. Um, one of the questions uh, that's come up, one of the topics that's come up that I wanted perhaps Paul and Graham to address was the issue of symptoms, symptomatic and non-symptomatic people. Um, Graham, I know you answered it on the chat, but if we could just revisit, I think um, there was an early question about how many people were asymptomatic and are you sure they really are asymptomatic or w when do you ask them about that? How does the, how does the um, questionnaire work? Yeah, and it is slightly different between React 1 and React 2, so I'll, I'll let Paul answer in a moment. But I think I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but broadly speaking, when we ask people in React 2 uh, whether they've had symptoms, I think it's around 35 percent of people don't report symptoms despite having a positive antibody test. And obviously, We'll come on to the, one of the other questions about the performance of the antibody tests, but that's probably, you know, if that gives you some sense that overall maybe it's about a third of people who are not getting symptoms, which is probably consistent with studies across. Now, in, in React 1, Paul will talk about it, but the definition is slightly different. So, Paul, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, so React 1, um, so the difference, so in React 2, they, they do their test so they know the result of their test and react one they don't know the result of their test and they're asked have you ha they're asked a whole bunch of symptoms um have you had symptoms today or in the past week and when we asked that question the most recent round 50 percent had not reported any symptoms in the past week it was actually higher in the previous rounds and that might be because there's been a little tendency for people who are symptomatic to take more of them to take part we think possibly 
because of the uh, inability to get a test through um, routine uh, the two testing. But we don't think that's massively biased our results. Um, now, it's possible that those people will go on to get symptoms and some of them will. But when we also look at the ONS data where they are following up individual people over time, we've got we've, we've got lot of cross sectional data repeated. They're looking at the same people over time, their strengths and weaknesses to both study designs. But when they do that, they get very similar answers to us around 50 percent or more who don't get symptoms, don't report symptoms and actually don't report symptoms in the future either. So, so I, you know, there are a lot of people who are infected and possibly infectious, some of them, uh, who don't know they've got symptoms. And that that's really important when it comes to the public health message. Mm, yeah. And the other aspect, I think, is that early on in the in wave one, wave two of React One, then it's likely that most of the virus being picked up was probably relatively distant infection that happened in March and April. And that might be changing now. So that that within React One, you're likely to see a shift to a to a smaller proportion of people being asymptomatic over time as, as the incidence rises. Yeah. Whereas React Two, it's probably going to be more stable. Well, we have some evidence for that because we look at the so-called CT value, which um, um, in the PCR gives you an indication of how much virus is there. And there's definitely been a trend in the last couple of rounds to lower CT values amongst the positive. Which is which meaning sort of more, a, meaning more virus, yeah. more virus, and um, and and probably reflecting more recent infection. Right. Okay. Um, I can see that Maisie McKenzie has joined us and got her hand up. Maisie, do you want to unmute and say anything? You're from the PPI advisory group. Um, it was just um, I wanted to say it was a really um, exciting experience to be joined um, to participate in uh, this project to support the team, particularly in the user testing perspective of the kit. Um, with the questionnaire, the surveys, we helped shape the questions um, just to help to make sure they made sense. Because as Philip has said, the perspective that you come from as an academic um, or a clinician is very different from that of a, a patient or service user. Um, and also testing the kit itself is very important. Um, we also help shape the booklets um, and I think, as Philippa said, our big concern was really about the data. What's going to happen to the data? Is it secure? Confidentiality, consent, all those big sort of information governance um, called kind of questions were really quite important for us. And the whole time we were involved in this piece of work, um, we really felt that our views were being appreciated and respected and valued and taken on board. Um, so it's a really interesting project to be involved in and we continue to be involved in it. And we. We're just pleased to be able to take part and help shape the direction of this to help to find a solution for the wider population, well, for the world, really. So that was all I wanted to say. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Maisie, for, for contributing that. It's great. My pleasure. Um, My pleasure. I suspect that we will lose some people because we're running slightly over. So I'm just going to take one or two more questions. Some of them are quite specific questions about the actual antibody tests themselves, the names and brands. Quite a lot of information is in the thorax paper about the percentages of specificity sensitivity. So um, I'm sure Graham will, will follow up with answers if necessary, but people can find, find that data out as well. But I think um, Emma Lawrence has posed an interesting question, which goes again perhaps to what Philippa was getting about, about the emotion of this. How many people or are there many people who believe they've had COVID but have no antibodies? Uh, and is this a higher proportion if they believe they had COVID further in the past. Graham, do we have any concept of how many we think, do, do we ask people if they think they've had it and, and they have an antibodies or not? We do and um, I think many people listening will be familiar with themselves or others who think they've had it and get an antibody test and um, often disappointed in a sense, as Philippa was alluding to, that they haven't been, uh, that it's not positive. And obviously there are different reasons as to why that might be, and, and that will differ according to the time. Clearly, the, the, the nature of the illness in March and April was much more specific from COVID than it might have been before that, where there were other viruses that would have been relatively common. Uh, and similarly, in, in August and July, there wasn't much circulating at all. So um, it does depend a little bit on when when those symptoms were as to how likely they are to be positive and then also on the particular tests that we have and, and, and we know that even the, the lab tests 
um, which measure a different antigen from the lateral flow tests can, can miss infections when they have happened. Um, Paul, I think you've, you've got some data on, on the number of people who believe they've had it and haven't, I think. Can you remember? So we, we do. I don't have it off the top of my head, but we do. We we do know um, who who reports each of, of a whole list of symptoms. We know who who tests positive. If you ask the people who test, if we look at the people who test positive and say, when do you think you had it? It beautifully reconstructs the epidemic curve in March, April, and actually Graham showed that slide. So, um, but clearly there's a lot of people who have had one or other of the of the symptoms on the list. Um, but but all test negative. So so the ones amongst those who test positive, and particularly we also ask, have you had a PCR test? And so then you, you know we have a pretty good idea that those people really are positive, and then you know we again we look at their symptoms. Yeah. So so we have a lot of this. We do have a lot of data on this. Um, and and but on the top of my head, I couldn't tell you the answer. I don't remember either, but I think it's worth just taking the opportunity to highlight the issue that may be lost on some people, which is that you know we're very much using this as a population level test, uh, and not for individual care. So. These tests, although we've done the validation, although we're quite confident in how they work, they don't meet the MHRA criteria for self-testing. And the sensitivity we've put in the chat there for the one we've chosen is about 85%. So we would expect you know, a decent number of people who've had definite infection not to have antibody responses to with this. And that's why we have to be very careful about the messaging around it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we are gonna to need to wind up very soon. I've got one question that's a sort of raw question. Paul, you have mentioned the ONS survey, which is sort of the parallel study to this. So, I mean, perhaps you could just reiterate, you know, why why does the UK need two surveys like this? And what, what do each one do? That, and how yeah. do they complement each other? So, so <clears throat> our study uh, from the beginning was much bigger. So we were able to give a, a more precise estimate of um, the actual level of virus in the community and then you know break that down below national level but uh, and also um we think the design is really good for looking at the r value because we look at the prevalence in different i mean they're different slices of the population but they're all randomly selected the ons survey has a different design it's household based so it can look at household transmission and it's also longitudinal so it, it repeats sampling on select individual people who select you know select themselves in um so although it's originally a randomly sampled sampled base uh there are people who who will agree to have multiple testing and and so forth so it is quite different um we're we're very confident in our data because we have seen uh we you know we we saw the the big decline early on we detected early on the rise and then we quantified that rise at the beginning of September in terms of the um, uh, the R value, which which, you know, with a seven to eight day doubling time and that proved to be the case. And we ended up with higher estimates than ONS of the of the high prevalence now. And we think that's because um, we, we probably have a more representative sample because of their, their need to have people who agree to be in multiple tests right. and also the, the design is that we send kit to people and then we pick that kit up they send people to people's homes so it's just a different approach so to pull to summarize you're better and cheaper is that right <laughs> you said that graham i'm <laughs> better value for money we 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 we, we are cheaper definitely Excellent. Uh, we and we and I think we do what we we say on the tin very well. So I think we're very pleased with the way it's come out. Good. I mean, as the world moves towards more and more testing and perhaps you know democratizing testing, Philip. I mean, what do you think is going to be the biggest problem in rolling out moonshot tests for everyone to use in their bathroom cabinet? Hmm. That's a, that's a difficult question, but I guess I can only. Um be inspired by the things that people, the members of the public have said of the issues at the moment, which is consistency and the clarity of messaging. You know, even if you just look at the, um, with um, this testing, multiple different antibody tests were tested and lots of different people are um, trying to sort of break into this space. And I think the key thing would be making sure that it's very clear 
what the process is, what one, you know, have one test that people do um, and make sure that everyone can access it. I think access to testing is a key thing. Um, already, you know, our study relies on people you know, receiving this letter and deciding to take part. Um, there is a, an opportunity for people who do not have access to internet to take part, but it's just, I think access to testing was um, a key thing that was mentioned um, and really making sure that it gets to everybody um, in a timely manner and that it's, it's possible um, and just making sure that the process is very clear and not um, yeah not having too many steps on too many different players sort of in the field um, and the support I think afterwards making sure that whatever the result if we're talking about virus testing or antibody testing I mean I guess it may not be so much for antibody testing as that's more for the population surveillance but if it's for the the virus testing i think just making sure that people have the the support and information that they need afterwards as well they, that they know what to do thanks philippa um i'm gonna th there's lots of questions coming up but i'm sure we really have to go i'm going to give the last question to graham which is one that came in from emma lawrence about what policy responses would you like to see based on this evidence what, what do you what do you think react can do to change how we're coping with this situation so uh, thank you for that wendy um for a short answer i mean i think that the key thing that we can do that we haven't done relates to how we could extend react one um and what we've demonstrated is that you can do testing at scale with speed with high return rates um with actionable results uh, that we're using for surveillance but we're not really using it as a public health tool. And um, if you're asking my personal point of view, then we're at a critical moment here in the country where we have clearly defined through React, through ONS and other studies, hotspots. And there is a debate, shall we say, or uncertainty about how far the restrictions will be on their own be able to control that. So I think there is a scope to do more with home-based testing rapidly. Now we've got the technology, it doesn't need new tests. Um, where we could do that in Liverpool and so forth, if we have the lab capacity. And I think lab capacity is the key issue. And that's where some of the tests, as Philippa was saying, around moonshot and some of the lateral flow tests for antigen, not for antibody, uh, may be helpful. So I think for me, that's the, probably the key thing where we could move policy in the next couple of weeks. All right. Thank you very much for a great answer. Thank you to all the speakers and all the people who've posted questions. I'm sorry if your particular question wasn't read out, but I am confident that if you follow it up with any of our speakers, they'll, they'll give you a, a great answer. Um, I think what REACT shows to me is, is how great it is to work in a team of people who bring diverse expertise uh, to, to tackle a big problem. And um, it's been a real fantastic experience for me, I can say that. Um, there will be another Global Health Forum, apparently, on the 5th of November, just before you go out and light your sparklers, looking at responding to COVID-19 through innovation. So I hope that you'll come back and join them and keep an eye on the IGHI website for more details coming up. Thanks to all our speakers today and all of you for, for taking part. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you.